Hello, welcome to my review of Spider-Man Homecoming. Spider-Man Homecoming, of course, is uh, Spider-Man Homecoming, uh, is of course the first Marvel movie to feature Spider-Man, and I think I just want to talk a little, well, the second movie to feature Spider-Man, but it's his first I want and I just want to talk a little bit about the concept of having characters such as Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, and X-Men in the MCU at the point this movie came out, and before then, obviously, when the MCU first started, everyone knew that Marvel didn't have the rights to Spider-Man, the X-Men, and the Fantastic Four, so, and that they had, they were left with the B-listers, you know? Captain, you say the B-listers, they're not all B-listers, but characters who now are incredibly, incredibly more well-known than they ever would have been before. You know, at the time the first Iron Man came out, people knew who Spider-Man was, they knew who, they knew who the Fantastic Four were, who, who the X-Men were, but nobody knew who, or very few people knew, who Iron Man was. And that movie changed it. When Captain America, the first Avengers came out, very few people, I say very few people, a lot of people still knew who Captain America was, but he wasn't as big as he is now. The same with the Hulk. Most definitely the same with Hawkeye and Black Widow. And, and, and to an extent, Thor as well, to be quite frank. And we all... Well, it was just a dream, really. When the Avengers came out, it it was a dream to have. It was just people thinking, holding out that it's never going to happen, but maybe, just maybe, if we all dream hard enough, Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, and X-Men will eventually join this universe. But it was never going to happen. None of us knew. It, obviously, when the Avengers came out, Amazing Spider-Man was coming out, so we all knew Sony had their own plans for Spider-Man. And as for the X-Men, well, they were still going in full force at that point, and they actually were quite good at that point because. Uh, when the Avengers came out, a year previous to the Avengers, you had uh, X-Men First Class, one of the best X-Men films. And then in the same year as Guardians of the Galaxy and the Winter Soldier, you have one of the other great comic book movies, uh, X-Men Days of Future Past. Also in between the two, there was uh, the Wolverine as well, and that was the thing. And obviously Deadpool and stuff, which is all fun. But but really, again, then that, that shit Fantastic Four fun came out. But we all knew that it, never in a million years were we ever going to see... Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, and X-Men in this universe. It would be lovely, but then we wouldn't. Then along came Civil War, and specifically the Civil War trailer, at least, because at the end of that, the trailer, at the end of the second trailer for Civil War, they make it a very big thing that Spider-Man is at the end of that film, is at the end of that trailer. And, of course, Spider-Man debuted in Spider-Man, in Civil War. And that's obviously because, obviously, the failure of The Amazing Spider-Man 2 and the fact that it flopped so hard that there was no other... They, it flopped so much harder than Spider-Man 3. It flopped so much harder than any previous Spider-Man film. And the fact that they really left themselves with no other choice but to just let Marvel do their job. And Marvel did their job and still got Sony paid a significant amount of money. I have to give them credit. Sony probably did have a good amount of control over it. And obviously... It does look like they're the only ones who can make Sp Spider-Man good Spider-Man movies is Marvel, which is why people were very upset when it was announced that Sony and Marvel were splitting ways and Spider-Man would become his own thing again. All because one company wanted more than the other, which is really a shame, but I suppose that is business at the end of the day. But um, that's the thing, you see, now we have all of these characters, we have Spider-Man in it, and we know for a fact now it's one of those things where it's not a possibility it's a probability. It, it It's not a possibility that these characters will join the MCU. It's just, it will happen. We already know, so obviously Spider-Man's already here. We already know that the fan, they're both working on the Fantastic, they're all working on the Fantastic Four film directed by the guy who directed the uh, Spider-Man movies, which is fine. And we all know that, we're, that it's been rumoured heavily and suggested that it's probably right. That they, obviously, Kevin Feige has also mentioned it in previous press conferences that they are working on a spide, on, on a fantastic, f uh, on an X-Men film tentatively titled under the working title, uh, The Mutants. So that's fun. But yeah, uh, just away from that, I just wanted to explain how just at the time this movie came out and when Civil War came out, it was like living a dream, really. I mean, obviously, I wasn't, my last Marvel movie I saw in the cinema was, was, was Doctor Strange before moving into... Uh, before then jumping, skipping all the way forward to uh, Avengers Infinity War, which is coming up soon, by the way. But yeah, my point is that, again, Spider-Man Homecoming uh, is just a breath of fresh air. It's good, to, but it's one of those films, along with, unlike films like Doctor Strange, Guardians of the Galaxy, it's very much not a, its own standalone story. It has heavy, 
heavy emphasis on the rest of the MCU. It's one of those films that it cannot be separated from the MCU, which is why everyone thought if Sony and Marvel were to split ways, it would be the end of Tom Holland playing Spider-Man, because there's no way you could have that actor playing that Spider-Man uh, in his own universe when he's interacted with, when so much of his character has relied on you can't really just write out Tony Stark and all that character development that you've set up in these two movies. You can't do that because it would just be so unnatural, which is why we were happy when they all came back together and stuff. But again, this movie has a very heavy emphasis on the Avengers. The Avengers are mentioned multiple times. The Avengers headquarters is there. The whole story is it's about uh, Peter, about this man using weapons from the aftermath of Avengers and so on and so forth. The beginning literally happened. Literally, the film starts in the aftermath of the first Avengers movie. Uh, and it really has a heavy emphasis. Tony Stark is there. Happy Hogan is there. Um, many other Avengers are there, but they are mentioned. I mean, obviously, the, the, the robbers with Thor's mask, uh, with the mask of the characters. Thor's mentioned by Happy Hogan. Hulk's mentioned by... Well, technically, the Hulkbuster's mentioned by Happy Hogan, but still. Uh, also, Vision is mentioned by Happy. Pepper Potts appears at the end. It all kicks off, really. Uh, and it really is a whole thing of it's really uh, tied into the universe. It's not one of these things where they put Spider-Man in, in, in Civil War and then they split him off from everyone else and gave him his own story away from everyone else. No, it's not. It's very much centered in the same universe. It's very much clearly... Uh, obviously, all these things are in the same universe, but what I'm trying to say is that some of them, you could really cut them out of the rest of the universe and they could be their own standalone, like the Guardians movies, uh, Doctor Strange... See, with Ant-Man, you'd have to make a few cuts here and there with, you know, some of the scenes. You'd have to make a few cuts here and there. The opening scene, any mentions of the Starks and stuff like that. But the Ant-Man, there's enough for the, at least the first Ant-Man film. At the moment, there's several films I can see the MCU that you could really... If you make a few cuts to some of them, you can have your own standalone set of uh, standalone movies. And those obviously are Guardians and Guardians 2, which don't need any cuts because they've got no references to the Avengers at all. Uh, Doctor Strange, again, doesn't need any cuts because it's got no references to the Avengers at all. Uh, and Ant-Man just needs a few, few cuts, like I said, the scene with Falcon in it, uh, the a few mentions of Stark, the opening scene needs to be cut all together, but I'm sure someone, I mean, if, if I had enough time and I had a hard copy of the film that I could cut in, it, in a good software, I could probably do it, but you can get, so that might be a thing I might do, Ant-Man, <laughs> the standalone cut, <laughs> to make it a standalone movie, not part of the universe, take the logo out of that stuff, it would be an effort, but I, I, I could do it, but it'd also be, I wouldn't be able to upload it on YouTube because I just instantly take it down because it's 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 basically it's not really the full movie. Actually, you could get away with it, but still, away from that, Spider-Man: Homecoming is a movie, and I think again the cast is on top. Everyone in casting here really well cast film. Tom Holland is just my favorite Spider-Man because he's not an adult trying to play a small child like Tobey Maguire is, and he's not just the absolute. The, with Andrew Garfield, he isn't the wrong person for Spider-Man. He was actually very good in his movies. He just he wasn't a bad Spider-Man. He was just a bad Peter Parker, if you ask me. He was actually really I enjoyed his portrayal of both characters. But I feel like if you're if you want a Peter Parker that's different from the comics, different from everything else, then he's your guy. But if you're looking for a Peter Parker who's accurate to the comics, then that Spider-Man just isn't it. I'm afraid. But yeah. I think everyone here is brilliant. Tom Holland is, like I said, my favorite Spider-Man. I love his character is just really well written. I suppose I love the scene in the monument. In uh, I don't even know what it's called now. You know, you know the scene. I mean, the monument scene. I enjoy that scene. I like Ned as a character. It's really funny, <laughs> and I can't wait to see him in the next film. Uh, Jacob Batalon does a great job playing him as well. Uh, it's good to see Stark again, although it, it, it reduced to... I wouldn't say Stark's role here is a cameo, and I wouldn't say Happy Hogan is a cameo either, but I would definitely say that Pepper Potts at the end of the film was very much a cameo, because she's literally just there for five seconds, which is fun. But yeah, it's good to see. It's weird where this film actually takes place, technically, because... Um, At the end of Civil War, we see them already moved into the new... I feel like we even see them moved into the new Avengers camp, new Avengers campus at the end of Age of Ultron. Yet in this film, he's still moving. I, I don't understand. 
it's very confusing. So, someone explain it. To me. I'm sure there's a way of figuring out what it all means, but I don't actually know, which is funny. But yeah, again, I I think this movie's so uh, so fun. I just I think it it brings. You know what? One of my favorite things about this movie is they strip away almost all of his origin because they know people have seen that twice over and they don't want to see it again. They don't want to see Uncle Ben getting shot. And in this movie, Uncle Ben is almost basically Tony Stark, except for me doesn't die and Peter doesn't use his death with great power. But, but he, the character that would have been Uncle Ben in this movie is essentially Tony Stark. Um, there's obviously no... It, there's obviously no... Gets bitten by a spider sort of thing. No gets used to dressing the powers, none of that. It cuts all the bull crap, and it's only passing mentions of the spider when he's talking to Ned, which I really admire the film for, you know, being able to actually do that. And I think it gives it a much more wanting ability to be able to rewatch it, because it cut, because you don't have to sit through the first act of them setting up, oh, bitten by a spider, Uncle Ben dies, blah, 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 that shit. It isn't, you don't have the first act, is isn't caught, bogged down by that. It's bogged down by its own plot and its own set of events, which is brilliant, I think. Michael Giacchino on scoring is brilliant. You know I care all about my scores, my movie scores. And Michael Giacchino, who returns from Doctor Strange uh, to score this movie, he does a good job. I do like... Uh, this is actually the first Marvel movie to use a completely different composition for the um, uh, for the Marvel logo other than the already pre-established ones and the movies that didn't have the pre-established songs or anything before Thor... Basically, any movie before Thor The Dark World didn't have the established pieces of music. To give you a rundown of the Marvel Logos music, the Marvel Logos didn't have a original piece of composition by any um, composer until Thor The Dark World, where you have an original piece by uh, Brian Tyler, which you can actually listen to on the official Thor The Dark World soundtrack. And then from Thor The Dark World all the way through to Captain America Civil War, it used that same that same um, Marvel Studios fanfare by Brian Tyler says Thor The Dark World, uh, Captain America The First Avenger, so, so, no, Thor The Dark World, Captain America The Winter Soldier, Guardians of the Galaxy, A Aven Avengers Age of Ultron, Ant-Man, and uh, Civil War, and Captain America Civil War, and then from Doctor Strange all the way through to present, including uh, Falcon and the Soldier, and presumably Loki, it uses a composition by Michael G. Chino, which he composed for Doctor Strange, not for Spider-Man Homecoming. But for Spider-Man Homecoming, he composed a different uh, studio's fanfare, which uses the theme tune from the original Spider-Man uh, TV series, which is really, really cool, and I think it's quite... <laughs> it works through. And it's also going to be the music you'll be hearing in the background of this video. If I can be bothered enough, because it's only 40 seconds long, so that's a lot of effort if this video goes over a longer length. So I'm going to have to just... Uh... Oh, well, this is going to be fun. This is going to be fun to edit. Yeah, I do like... Uh, another one of my favourite scenes in this movie is when Peter hasn't got his suit and he's underneath all the rubber and he, r rubble and he realises that it's not the suit that Spider-Man, it's him and he uses that and he gets himself up from under the rock. I think it's brilliant. I love the character of the Vulture. Michael Keaton is perfect. He's so sinister and I love him in the car scene when he starts to piece together that... that, um... That Peter is Spider-Man, and I love the use of the lighting across his face in that scene. If you watch that scene back before, you can tell when he figures it out because the lighting across his face changes, and it's a really good subtle use of lighting. And I really do appreciate those kind of things in a movie like this. Again, I said Michael Keaton's Michael Keaton's performance is brilliant, and I love him in the post-credit scene where obviously he, obviously Peter saved his daughter, but also screwed up his plans ex excrementally. So he's given this opportunity. This man says. I heard that you know who Spider-Man is, and obviously at that point, technically he's given an ultimatum. Do I tell the guy who he is, or do I stick up for Peter? And obviously, because he knows Peter's... I don't know why he does it, but it's just nice to see him actually sticking up for Peter. Because instead of saying, oh, I know who he is, he says, if I knew who he was, he'd already be dead. So that's sort of a nice little thing anyway. Again, it's nice to see setting up characters like MJ to be the future. Obviously, in this film, he's got the single love interest, which is Liz. And I was just thinking when watching the film, this is not like any other Spider-Man film where at the end he gets the girl, he walks off, he kisses her and all that stuff. It's not like that, because at the end of this film, he's not he doesn't get the girl, he loses the girl. And the girl goes and moves upstate, crying. So it, it, I like the difference in that this is trying to say we're not going to be like every other Spider-Man movie. 
despite the fact it tries to set itself up to be, it says, no, we're not going to do it like this. And that's good. Do I think this movie is um, as good as Doctor Strange or Guardians of the Galaxy? No. Do I think it's better than some of the other MCU titles? Yeah. Do I think its sequel is better? Um, personally, I do think Far From Home is a better film, but that's just me personally. I have a heck of a ball with Far From Home. I just think, and I cannot wait for Spider-Man for Spider-Man No Way Home, which hits theatres uh, on December 17th, 2021. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys for watching my review of Spider-Man Homecoming. It's a brilliant film, I recommend it all. And tomorrow, it's one of my absolute MCU favourites. And uh, I have a nice little story about the ne this next film. And obviously, it is, of course, the god, the godlike Thor Ragnarok. So, catch you tomorrow for Thor Ragnarok. And bye-bye. Have a good day. And don't forget to check out all the links in the description below. Bye-bye.